at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh, it's Science Tonight. Now here's your host, Chris Smith. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Science Tonight, our show for curious people who like to learn new things and have a good time doing it. That's right. That's what we do every Thursday night right here on the show. It's good to be with you all once again. Tonight, we've got an exciting topic for you and one I think you're going to find pretty interesting. I know that I do. I've been learning a little bit about it, getting to know tonight's guest speaker, and it's going to be a great show, Chasing Dragonflies with Helicopters and Chainsaws. I'm not even really sure how you do that, but I'm excited to learn about it. As always, every week with Science Tonight, when you tune into the program, I want to hear your thoughts and questions too. So make sure that you jump into the chat. If anything, just say hi. Let me know where you're tuning into the program from, local, not local, wherever you may be. And of course, as we go through tonight's program, leave your questions in the chat for our guest speaker. Uh, we'll do the little uh, questionnaire at the beginning to get to know our guest. We'll talk about the science for a little while, and then we will take your questions. So make sure that you are queuing up those questions for me. Anything that pops into your brain about tonight's topic, type it into the chat. That way we'll be ready to go when the time comes. An announcement for everybody. Uh, I wanna go ahead and let everybody know that June, at the end of this month, will be uh, the end of Science Tonight for a little while. We're gonna be taking the month of July and August off from the show. So we're gonna be going on a little bit of a summer hiatus. Make sure that you check out naturalsciences.org to see the lineup for the remainder of this month. For example, next Thursday night, we're actually gonna be talking to museum paleontologist, Dr. Lindsay Zano, live from the dinosaur quarry they're working at right now in New Mexico. That's going to be fun. Don't want to miss out. But July and August, we're taking the summer off. Keep an eye out on the museum social media and website for details on when you can look for me <laughs> to be back here with you. Maybe in person at the museum. We'll see. Uh, or right back here on YouTube and on Facebook. Okay. I think that was all of the announcements that I had to make. Let me introduce tonight's guest. For Chasing Dragonflies tonight, we've got Dr. Amy Thompson. Dr. Thompson is an assistant professor of biology at North Carolina Wesleyan College over in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. Dr. Thompson also happens to be a world expert on a species of dragonfly called the common green darner. Dr. Thompson is also Okay, the resume keeps going. A former National Park Service ranger, and she's written curricula on dragonflies for schools and educators that have been translated into at least now two different languages. Very happy to have Dr. Thompson on the show. Amy, welcome to Science Tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Very glad to have you. Maybe I should warn everybody uh, that Dr. Thompson, you and I actually go back a little ways. Uh, we met at a professional conference, I want to say five or six years ago, maybe even further back. Um, and so I've actually gotten to see some of your research as it's played out on social media, the way that you've shared it with some of uh, shared it with with the world and been the recipient of more than a couple of uh, Snapchats from like, I don't know how you got cell service in like remote field locations in Minnesota, but it's been very exciting to see this dragonfly journey. Yeah, you got to see me transition from environmental educator into research scientist. That's really what I've been doing over the past five, six years. So yeah, thanks for coming along with me on that journey. What's interesting is I remember that when I started working at the museum uh, and you were working on your PhD on dragonflies at the time in conservation biology in Minnesota, mm -hmm. I remember asking you, I was like, if you're ever in North Carolina, I should have you come give a presentation on your research inside the big globe, the Daily Planet Theater. 
I said, yeah, that, of course, that sounds great. And now, of course, you're in North Carolina and the presentation has to be virtual. Well, this will just be a teaser. I'll have to come back again and do it in person in the big globe. Definitely, absolutely. Bug Fest is coming up soon, coming up soon. So uh, folks who tune into the program regularly know that we start the show by getting to know our guest just a little bit with an activity that I call the non-science questionnaire. It's not nonsense, it's just non-science. Amy, did you feel up for a few uh, interesting questions? All right. First question for you, right out of the bat. Is a picture worth a thousand words? Heck yeah. I mean, I guess it depends on the words, but for sure, right? I mean, unless it's a terrible photo. I mean, I guess it depends on the quality of the photo and the quality of the words. But generally speaking, yes. Picture's worth a thousand words. That is the correct answer. There are no <laughs> correct answers. Next question. Uh, one of my favorites in the questionnaire. Does pineapple belong on pizza? Yes. Yes. For sure. Also with some bacon. We can discuss the bacon, but pineapple on pizza, that is also the correct answer. Very good. So you're two for two. Very nice. Next question. Besides your current job, what other job or career could you see yourself having? Ooh, that's a good question. I must be outside in whatever I'm doing. So if I'm at a desk and it's going to turn into a grumpy monster, so my alternative job has to be outside. I mean, and obviously I did the park ranger thing already, so I know that worked. So maybe I should be a little more creative and choose something else. Um, <laughs> maybe like maybe like a tree trimmer, or like um, like a somebody that has to climb into stuff like caves or trees or or like maybe oh I know what I'd be like a a like a guide for coral reefs. I just want to snorkel at it all day. Oh, now see, that, that sounds fabulous. If you could have a mm -hmm. job just exploring coral reefs. Yeah. Also the correct answer. Three for three <laughs> on the questionnaire that has no right answers. Okay, next one. What number am I thinking of? Three. Mm, close. Oh. What's a weird fact you know that you feel like no one else knows? Mm. Well, when I'm standing at the edge of a pond, I know where underwater the common green darners are. Like, I just know. I can scan it and I can walk to that spot and like dip net in and find a darner. Like, I know where they are. We're connected, the darners and I. Just like that. Mm -hmm. So, also, what? I feel oh like my I need gosh. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can just look at a pond and point to where the darners are. Could you point and then, like, tell a grad student assistant, like, put the net in there, and then boom, out come the darners? Yes, I have years of experience doing that. <laughs> Make, makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Well, everybody, that was uh, four out of five correct answers on the non-science nonsense questionnaire. So big round of applause for Dr. Amy Thompson. Great wait, job wait, on so that what one. Number, what number were you thinking of? I wish we had time for that, but we need to move on to the science interview <laughs> okay. part of the program tonight. <laughs> we need to move on. Uh, Dr. Thompson, for all the folks at home, give us an idea of you and the research that you did. Okay, so I'm interested 
and two groups of dragonflies. I'm super interested in the ones that are really rare, where you have to fly around on helicopters and find them. And I'm really interested in the ones that are really common. And the reason I think common species are so fascinating is because being common is rare. There are many, many, many rare species, but there's only a few species that are really common. So I like the idea of learning about both to compare and contrast. Wait, okay, hold on, I'm already stumped. Being common is rare? Being common is rare. There are, if you think about all the species in the world, if you were just able to put them all on the table in front of you, like 90% of them would be rare species and 10%, I'm making up these numbers, but like 10% or so, very few of them would be common. So becoming common is not something that evolution selects for very often. And so I'm curious, why is it so uncommon? Why don't we have more common species? Why do we have so many rare ones and so few common ones? Okay, very interesting. And so how do dragonflies in that case fit into this? How did you come to answer uh, what sounds like a pretty big question by looking at dragonflies? Oh, I'm nowhere near answering it yet. I'm just beginning to explore. <laughs> but um, so for my dissertation work, I picked arguably the most common dragonfly in the Western hemisphere. If you look at its range map, it's just solid colored in for um, like United States and sneaks into Canada and goes down into Central America. The common green darner is everywhere. So surprisingly, we don't really know that much about the natural history of common green darners. We know some, but Somebody had to sit out in their prairie next to next to the pond and watch them for a few years and collect the nymphs out of the water for a few years and just get all that baseline data. So we could begin to speculate about what questions to ask. So yeah, that's the common green darner on your screen right now. That was the one that I collected in later, late early fall in Minnesota. So it was a little cold. I shared some of my body heat with it, warmed it up a little bit hopefully it got enough heat so that it could migrate away. So this species, the com this common green darner, they migrate, which is so cool. So this one in fall, its goal would be to up and fly away south to southern United States, maybe Central America, where it would lay some eggs, and those eggs would grow up, and their offspring would come back to Minnesota in spring. So part of the reason why they're so common, I think, is because they are able to migrate. I mean, that, that's a, a gorgeous looking dragonfly. It also looks enormous. Yeah, they're pretty big. It's like, I think they look like they were painted by a watercolor artist, one that really likes rainbows. Mm. So, okay, I don't, did I know that dragonflies migrate? I mean, it, I guess it kind of makes sense. They can live a long time, more than a, a year or two, I guess. Well, they spend most of their lives underwater as nymphs. So especially the ones that live farther north, okay. they can live you know, three, four years underwater as aquatic nymphs before they metamorphose into adults. And once they become adults, they don't live for very long. Most dragonflies maybe live a few weeks. The common green darner lives longer unless it's eaten by something. Barring that, it can live for maybe a month or two and during that time, it, they, if, it's, if they have to, they don't migrate in summertime because they don't have to move. They have all the food and the temperatures they need. They only migrate in spring and fall when they're being driven to either fly north to explore new habitats where it's warmer or fly south to find warmth when it gets cold up north. So then were you studying adult dragonflies like running around with nets trying to swoop them out of the air or is the research looking at the the over the the uh the nymphs the juveniles mm -hmm. well my favorite thing to research is the nymphs i actually have one here in front of me uh, if i can show it to the camera this is not a common green darner nymph but it is a dragonfly nymph 
that I collected here in Rocky Mount. Let's see if I can hold it up to the camera. Can you see? It's alive. It's just playing dead a little bit. So look at those big hooks, those big dorsal hooks. Um, it's super fun to collect the nymphs out of the water. And when I was doing my research, I was collecting the common green darner nymphs to measure how they grow over time. And we would observe the adults. We didn't collect the adults. When I was doing all of that research on the rare species, we were collecting the adults because those nymphs are so dang hard to find, especially in the bogs and peatlands. They live in these teeny tiny little pools, sometimes the size of the circle my hand is making. And we'd have to fly into the bogs with helicopters and dip net and hundreds of circles just to find one nymph. So in that scenario, it was easier to collect the adults than it was the nymphs. <laughs> Wait, okay, so this is where the, the helicopters part of chasing dragonflies must come in. Which which sounds mm -hmm. like an odd thing to try to chase a dragonfly in, but I guess that's the only way to get to some of these locations where they live. Exactly. Yeah. Sadly, we're not actually chasing the dragonflies while we're in the helicopter. It's not like a action movie. The helicopter. I mean, it kind of action movie. Like the helicopter would bring us into the bogs and peatlands, which um, we needed to go very deep into them, too far to hike. Walking through a bog is really difficult. And so we flew in with the helicopter and the helicopter would sort of get as close as possible to the ground. It'd have to hover a little bit because the helicopter would just sink if it landed on the bog vegetation, just kerplunk into the water. So it would hover and we would jump out with our nets. Yeah, that's a photo I took from the helicopter. You can see how watery it is. And we would jump out with our nets and then run around and try and find adults and try and find nymphs in a couple hours where the helicopter would come back and pick us up and bring us to the next spot. So I know we have some members of the Minnesota Dragonfly Society in the audience today, and I did those adventures that work through the Minnesota Dragonfly Society. I mean, that sounds very uh, exciting, adventurous. Not the kind of work that I typically picture when I think of dragonfly science. Not that dragonfly science isn't exciting and adventurous, but jumping out of helicopters into like knee deep wetlands and then making sure you don't miss your ride out. Do you ever just get stuck in the muck? Um, yeah, I have never gotten stuck. I've fallen through a couple times. So when you're walking on the peatland, it's just um, the matted roots of the vegetation around you in most places. And sometimes it gets real thin. And especially if you're chasing a dragonfly that you're trying to catch, you're running, you don't stop very carefully and you can thunk, just sort of fall through. <laughs> so um, it's not something you do alone. Yeah, so there's a couple of my, that's the inside of the helicopter. Um, uh, we have a whole bunch of different people that work together to make this happen. Those are some members of my team. And um, we all have to wear those little headphones and communicate with each other. And you can see on the other side of Jay in there on the end, we, we fly in the helicopter with the doors off because it makes it easier for us to hop in and out while the helicopter is hovering. And it is very like, um, kind of feels like 007 -y. And you're right. I mean, I think most people think that of scientists as wearing these lab coats and we have glasses on and we're in like a white sterilized room and we're hunched over a microscope. Uh, that's, that's part of it. That happens too. But the adventure is really what drew me to it, what made me feel so excited and passionate about getting my PhD and pursuing research. That is my all-time favorite photo. That photo was taken by Kurt Owen. And if I were to have a band, this would be the cover of my album. So you can see that we're standing That in the was water. what I was going to say about this picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's me and then one of my colleagues, Mitch Haig, he was the one, I wrote the grant for the helicopter and he organized the details of where we would go and got the permits and his son, Jason, who was a phenomenal catcher of dragonflies came along. So that picture is Kurt Oyen who took that photo. So pretty, pretty ridiculous team, but you may notice something about that photo. Um, all of my field oh, colleagues. Let me bring it back up here. Almost, yeah, almost all of them are men. 
So one of the things I always like to talk about when I get a chance to stand in the platform is that um, being a woman in science has some challenges. You don't get the chance to see people that look like you very often. Um, I need to say all of the men that I've worked with in the field of dragonflies ha have been kind and welcoming and amazing, but they don't know what it's like to be a woman in the field. And it's nice to have a female mentor. So um, if there are any young women out there or older women, I got my PhD 20 years after my undergraduate, which is unconventional. If there's any women out there at all, see me as somebody who's holding the door open for you to pursue a career in science or research because it helps to have somebody give you a little boost in that way. Well, tell us a little bit then about your path into science, how you found biology, ecology, and what got you interested in dragonflies in the first place? Yeah, so I have an unconventional path into becoming an academic. Um, I was an environmental educator and I was loving it. Um, I was always interested in science and research though. And um, I got um, sort of not so gently guided away from research and into education when I was in my early 20s um, because I was a woman. And um, I had a conversation with the person that hired me about that before I left and he confirmed that he put me in the position he put me in because he thought because I was female, I would work better with education than I would with chain size. So that was an interesting start. But then I ended up following my nose back into the things that excited me. I met a man named Kurt Mead. He wrote the book, Dragonflies of the North Woods. And working with him inspired me to write a dragonfly curriculum for teachers about how to use dragonflies as tools for teaching science in the classroom. And as I was writing that book, I was reaching out and making new connections with all of these people who had done similar work. And one of the people that I connected with was Karen Oberhauser. She was at the University of Minnesota and she is a brilliant scientist doing research on modern butterflies, but she took me under her wing along with her colleague, Rob Blair. And I worked with them for years and I expressed interest in research, but also trepidation because I don't come from a family where um, education is something that was highly prioritized to do with your time and money. So neither of my parents have advanced degrees. So I was just didn't feel like I was in that world. Like I wasn't sure academia was for me. But then Rob and Karen invited me one summer. They were awarded a grant from the National Science Foundation and they needed to hire a graduate student who could do curricular writing, which is something I'm really good at. And in exchange for me working for them, I would be in graduate school and in my PhD. And they told me I could study anything I wanted to about dragonflies. And um, that opportunity was just too good to pass up. So I jumped in both my feet, my whole body, deep water, deep end, and made a quick transition from educator tacking on becoming an academic, becoming a scientist. And now biology professor, here in North Carolina. Yeah, so now it's all coming together, right? So I get to do this amazing research. I'm continuing my research on rare species and common species, and I get to teach too. And I can tie those things together to give my students at Westland an opportunity to know what it's like to be a scientist, to be a researcher, to open that door for them the way that that door to academia was opened for me. And not everybody needs to become a scientist. You don't need to run out and get your PhD and study dragonflies for the rest of your life to sort of get the feeling that science is for you. There's a lot of fun things you can do just for enjoyment, like citizen science programs or coming to listen to talks put on by you. Yes, absolutely. Tell everybody to come watch Science Tonight to get inspired, to get engaged <laughs> in science. I totally will. Uh, so, the, the, <laughs> well, I more meant everybody, everybody watching should go tell somebody else to come enjoy the show again. Um, so I'm, I'm curious then about what some of the results of your research was. Mm. Um, tracking dragonflies <laughs> by chasing them with helicopters. Uh, and you just mentioned chainsaws too. 
which you also had mentioned to me when we were getting ready for the show. Um, and you sent some some pretty amazing pictures of of you wielding a chainsaw in the like most dramatic instance of ice fishing <laughs> I think I've ever seen. Yeah, that's me. I'm borrowing Kurt Oyen's chainsaw and his safety gear. And we actually put Hello Kitty ch stickers on his chainsaw because <laughs> we had a conversation one evening about um, kind of the uh, gender in science and research and in um, wildlife management and biology and our sort of silly solution to make a chainsaw more gender neutral was to put some Hello Kitty stickers on it. But what I'm doing in this photo is I'm cutting the ice into blocks. You can see an ice block in the background. And I, I'm taking out that block, it, not just me, it requires multiple people, those blocks of ice are really heavy. But we cut them into small cubes so we can yank them out. And then we can get at the nymphs that are living below the ice. So one thing that's crazy about these common green darners is, yes, yeah, some of them migrate, the adults migrate, but a little aquatic nymph can't migrate. So come fall, if it's not mature enough to metamorphose, it has to stay in the water, it has to stay put. So I wanted to know what the heck are those nymphs doing under the ice over winter? And the only way to find out is to get in there. So we just got some chainsaws. Yeah, there's another great picture. And we cut out these, these big strips of in the water. Sometimes we did squares. We tried all different shapes. These long strips seem to be pretty good for getting at the nymphs. And we take those aquatic nets and dip net. And I collect the nymphs and bring them back into the lab and measure them. And I was able to just discover some pretty pretty cool stuff about common green darner nymphs. There's one in my hand right now. Um, one interesting thing about these nymphs, frankly, is that they often all die over the winter. It's sometimes a terrible strategy for them. If it gets too cold and the ice gets too thick, oh, wow. the water gets too anoxic, and they just all die. Like one day I might dip my net in there and just get nothing but dead common green darners. Now, the less common species, the more rare species, they can live through those cold winters where this common green darner species cannot. So there's an interesting thing going on there. Um, uh, I'm trying to think okay. about more results. Okay. So that's one thing that my my research showed from dip netting in the winter was that there are kind of, we call them two growth pathways of common green darner nymphs. Some of them are eggs that are laid in the spring by the migrators and they grow super duper fast and they metamorphose and fall and fly away and migrate. And then there are ones that we call the winter growth pathways. And something happens with those nymphs, like the eggs were laid too late, or maybe the water was too cold, or maybe this for some reason they weren't eating as much and they grow too slowly, so they aren't ready to metamorphose and migrate in fall. And those are the nymphs that hang out over winter. Okay, wow, so many interesting strategies to try to survive. I mean, I've always heard that Minnesota has some pretty harsh winters. And of course I'm seeing like blocks of ice that look like they're two feet thick. Uh, so I'm kind of surprised that there's very many of anything that survive in some of these habitats. That That's the curiosity about insects in cold climates. I mean, they're just teeny tiny little things. How do they survive in such extreme conditions? Yeah, so my the chainsaw bar was 20 inches and there were many days where, you know, the bar just barely got through the ice. Like we had to jump on the blocks and stomp on them to break them. And these ponds aren't more than maybe three or four feet deep at their deepest. So we, that's why we couldn't push the blocks down. Like anybody that ice fishes, I think they might know that you push a block down inside of under the ice or you auger a hole, um, but the ice was too deep compared to the water underneath. So I bought these old antique like um, ice tongs and we would grab onto the ice and pull it out so we could get underneath. So the interesting thing about dragonflies <laughs> right now, and this is different than maybe some of your other guests, is we honestly don't know that much about the most basic things. So birds have been studied to wazoo. Like we know so much about birds. I won't say everything, because there's always more to learn, but we know so much more about birds than we do dragonflies. So sometimes being a dragonfly scientist is more like 
being in like the turn of the 17th century or 18th century, just wandering around looking at things and being like, that's weird. I wonder what's going on there. I'm just going to observe that for a little while. That's kind of the joy of it for me. <laughs> this is the outside observation. But then you, then you synthesize it and then you get a question that turns into a research question and all of a sudden you can run an experiment in your lab and test out something to see if your idea about what you saw in nature is, is accurate. It's super fun. That's a photo of me in Wisconsin and at this glorious little stream there are these dragonflies that are called spike tails live in that stream and they will oviposit the females. Like, you know, when they fly around, they usually fly around kind of horizontal. Well, the females, when they want to lay eggs, they put their body vertical and they just plow straight down into the water. So their ovipositor is at the far end of their tip of their abdomen, tip of their tail, and they just plow into the water, go all the way under, kerplunk, shove some, shove some eggs into the substrate, come back out and zoom back down. So on this particular day, I was just looking for them because I think they're cool. I did not have any particular research question in mind. I just think they're really nifty. And I did find some. I found some nymphs and some adults. I'd have to say, when I was thinking dragonfly research, pictures like that or or sort of like grass prairie areas was what, was what I had in mind. Uh, but then you shared pictures of these bog habitats and peat habitats and and the ice fishing blew my mind that was such cool stuff i want to remind everybody who's tuned in to the show tonight uh drop your questions for dr thompson in the chat whether you're watching on facebook or youtube we'll be getting to those in just a minute uh, but go ahead get your thoughts questions comments queued up for us that way, when we move into audience Q&A, we're ready to go. And if you've tuned in just a few minutes after the start, tonight on Science Tonight, we're talking with Dr. Amy Thompson, dragonfly scientist at North Carolina Wesleyan College, who has studied dragonflies with all kinds of great methods, like helicopters and chainsaws. <laughs> so, Amy, have you had opportunity to get around North Carolina? Do you have any North Carolina dragonflies that you're really interested in? What about uh, our local environments? Do you think might be well, interesting to study? first of all, I'm thrilled to be here. So Chris knows this, but I've only been now in North Carolina for about a year and a half. So I just started teaching at North Carolina Wesleyan the semester that COVID started. So I was <laughs> hit hard. But the cool thing about the pandemic was that being outside is always super safe. So I have been happy as a clam in my waders and streams, walking around and exploring things. Um, every, pretty much every bug I find makes me really happy because lots of them are new. Um, any particular species that I'm really interested in right now, there are, in the mountains, there are a group of, there's, well, it's the genus called Ophiogonthus. So Ophio is Latin for snake. And this group of dragonflies are called the snake tails. And they need tiny, pristine, fast flowing, ripply streams to be in. And there is all sorts of cool snake tails that live in the mountains that I would love to get my hands on and look at more closely. So uh, maybe I can try and do that this summer. I'm gonna head out there hopefully in the next week or two, but the joy of being here in North Carolina is it doesn't get cold. There's no winter ice research, which honestly, I don't miss a whole lot. I mean, it was exciting, but I like that my face does not hurt in winter and that I can find aquatic insects without a chainsaw <laughs> all year round. <laughs> yeah, so you've experienced one North Carolina winter then uh, out east in Rocky Mount. Yeah, I don't. I can't imagine that it compares to a Minnesota winter at all. No, I mean there was one day when it snowed, and that did make me feel a little nostalgic for Minnesota. But then I remembered how terrible it is to drive in the snow, and about how there was a couple inches of snow and everything shut down. I didn't have to drive, so I was like, "This is nice. I like it here." <laughs> excellent, excellent stuff. Well, uh, let's see. Amy, are you ready for some questions from our audience? Yes. 
All right. So folks, I'll remind you one more time, drop your thoughts and questions into the chat. We've got lots pulled up here, ready to go. First one that I've got for you, uh, Chuck wants to know, is a blue tail fly a dragonfly? And then he writes, brush away the blue tail fly. Do you know what we're talking about? No, I don't. Um, there are tiny little damselflies that are sort of a sister group of dragonflies that maybe is a blue tail fly, but I don't know. Do you, is this like a, a southern thing? Should I know the blue tail fly? Brush away the blue tail fly. I don't know. I've not. Chuck, you're going to have to jump back in the chat and help me out with this one. I'm well, so I'm not curious sure about now. This one. Okay. That means I can go. Yeah. Now I need to know, Chuck. Help us out. Okay. Uh, next one is from Troy. Hey, Troy. Thanks for being here again. What are primary sources of revenue and grants since flying on a helicopter <laughs> would be expensive? Oh, you asked a doozy of a question, Troy. Um, I actually got my funding or the funding that was granted to the Minnesota Dragonfly Society um, from Enbridge Oil Company, which was contentious because the oil companies don't really have a great reputation for doing wonderful things for the environment. And this company was proposing to build a pipeline through northern Minnesota, which were the counties we were interested in researching. But they, um, in parallel with this proposal, they had what they called an eco footprint grant. So they gave they gave the Minnesota Dragonfly Society nearly I think it was a well over fifty thousand dollars for this research we could use in helicopters, and um, we used it for research. We had a really robust and emotional and authentic and vulnerable conversation as a board of the Minnesota Dragonfly Society. What does it mean to seek funding in these areas? So um, we covered all of the pros and cons and ultimately decided to take advantage of the opportunity. Excellent, thank you. All right, Glenn. Hi, Glenn, thanks for being here. Does the large size of the green darner perhaps contribute to them being common? Oh, that's an interesting question. I do think it contributes to their ability to migrate. Um, and I think their ability to migrate also is connected to their commonness. Um, they are less likely to become prey when they're large as nymphs, which is probably when they're the most vulnerable besides when they metamorphose. And um, not doesn't help them so much as adults. In fact, one of the things that they're sort of famous for when they migrate is they're sort of a lunch buffet for a lot of the migrating raptors that migrate parallel with them. So there are photos of kestrels and merlins flying with the flocks of common green darners and just feasting off them like an airborne buffet as they're flying. So I think as an adult, their large size helps them migrate, but it doesn't help them avoid predators. But them being large in the pond as aquatic nymphs does help them succeed. So that could be part of the reason that they're so common. But there are many tiny common dragonflies too. So that's a really good question. And I don't know the answer to it. Okay. Yeah, good one, Glenn. Although, you know, okay, now I'm thinking you dragonfly migrations. Um, can you, uh, do dragonflies migrate in, in like great big groups or swarms? Like you might see a flock of birds right head mm -hmm. over head as they're migrating you uh, a flock of dragonflies might be too small to notice but do we see phenomenon similar to that with dragonflies yes so in fall dragonflies mm -hmm. will migrate from northern latitude south in groups but in springtime they sort of trickle up individually and we know this because people that monitor raptor migration have also been witnessing the migration of dragonflies on the same pathways in big swarms. I actually made a video about this that'll be posted on the Wings Across America Facebook page, which is made by the US Forest Service International Programs Division. And they do all this cool outreach and education and conservation on things that migrate. And I talk about how do we know the dragonflies migrate? And I talk about the connection between birders and people that study dragonflies. We're called odonatologists. 
Odonata is the order name for dragonflies and damselflies. So sometimes you're out looking for one thing and you discover something completely different and that leads to all this new knowledge about something else, something new. Excellent stuff, really. Uh, you'll have to you'll have to send me the link to the video. I want to see that one. I'll keep an eye out for mm -hmm. it. That's I'm exciting. Doing that would be a fun one to share. Vibration this summer for them. So mostly every week, hopefully every week, if I can stay on the ball, a video about dragonfly migration that'll be going on their social media. Wings across the Americas. That is cool. Congrats on that. That's fun. Uh, everybody, go, go find, go find uh, Dr. Thompson on the socials. Okay, lots of good questions rolling in here. Uh, do you ever use citizen science for data collection? Asks Aaron. Yes, 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 yes. So there are two amazing resources that all people can participate in, and one of them is called Odonata Central. So Odonata is the order name. If you already probably are using one if you're into citizen science called I'm Naturalist. So you can support you can support your um, include your dragonfly findings on either of those. They talk to each other. They play together. So if you like I'm Naturalist, you can use that. If you want to use Old Medicine Central, you can use that. In fact, the Dragonfly Society of the Americas, we are instead of an annual conference, we're calling it Old Olympics. And we're going to do um, a kind of like an ongoing citizen science I'm Naturalist project. So if you want to geek out on your dragonfly, uh, I naturalist citizen science stuff, check it out on I naturalist. There I should also go. say, there sorry, go, the legs overlap on you, but I I actually that's how I met Kurt Mead that got me excited about dragonflies in the first place that led to me getting my PhD. It was from citizen science. Like there for me, there was a direct connection between between being a citizen scientist and then becoming a quote unquote re real scientist. So they're pretty intimately connected. Excellent, excellent. All right, uh, let's see, next up, are there any unexpected North Carolina species you found? Hmm. Um, Honestly, all of them are delightful surprise for me at the moment. Um, I have, I've kind of had my head narrowly in the sand of common green darner ponds and bogs and peatlands. Um, I, you know, I'm thinking about bogs and peatlands and the most delightful thing I saw so far actually were the Venus flytrap. I've never seen them like wild before and I totally geeked out when I saw those and the pitcher plants. So like those those bog peatland species that I'm seeing here in North Carolina, they have they're so different than the ones in Minnesota. And while dragonflies are the sort of um, face, the charismatic face of what I study, what I'm really interested in is the ecology. So the interaction of all the living things and non living things, the air temperature, the rocks, the soil, the plants, the dragonflies, and um, in bogs and peatlands. And wow, things are so different here. So maybe not just one species that has amazed me, but just how the parallel habitats are, have similarities, but they're also so different. It's like, um, it's like stepping through sort of like an upside down crazy world where some things are familiar and um, some things are new. It's exciting. Excellent. And you also kind of answered Sean's question there, which was, what have you found is the biggest difference between dragonflies in North Carolina and Minnesota? Certainly the habitats are different. Do you see major differences between the species? Yeah, so I'm perpetually confused by the lack of winter here. Like uh, my, my calendar <laughs> is reset by snow. It's like the end of the year is snow and then things die or go into a diapause or a quiescence and then they reanimate in spring. And so I just feel sort of like I am not understanding what's going on when. Like this morning I was just talking with my boyfriend and I said it was the middle of summer because to me it feels like it's been hot for so long that it should be the middle of summer but it's only the beginning of June. 
So I'm struggling with the phonology, like without the marking of time that I'm used to from a temperate zone into a more southern zone. But it's a struggle I'm pleased to be having. There you go. Excellent. Okay, uh, let's see. What other cool things did you find when you dip netted under the ice? Oh, that's an awesome question. So other kinds of dragonflies. So there were others in the skimmer family, which survived just fine. Um, there were damselflies called the lestid. That's, so the that's common name are the spread wings. Those are also just fine. Um, ooh, I would find these really um, crazy looking things called Helgramites. They um, look like, you don't see that movie Tremors? Ooh, yeah. They look like tiny versions mm -hmm. of the Tremor monster. <laughs> and they have big pinchy I know claws. Helgramites, yeah. But, so a lot of the aquatic creatures in Minnesota overwinter in the larva stage. And they seek shelter being in places like underwater, or some of them do under tree bark or under the leaf litter. And we would find lots of those overwintering creatures. Sometimes I would find a salamander larva. Sometimes I would find, oh, um, the bladderwort, which is a aquatic plant that eats living things. It has tiny little balloons that suck up tiny little things and digests them. We'd find that under the ice. Just I, I, if you get a chance to do that, if you live someplace in the world where there's ice on the water in winter, just go out there and dip net. Everybody ice fishes. It's fun. Yeah, it's cool. But do something just new and just dip net in there and see what you find. The discovery is one of the biggest joys of being a scientist. On that note, Danielle has posted a great question. What do you recommend for people just getting started with oding? Uh, and then Danielle writes, I've heard it's a gateway drug for birders. <laughs> that is so true. So birding and oding, so odonata, oding, go together beautifully because dragonflies don't really start flying around until like 11 o'clock when it starts to get warm and hot. So if you're a birder, you get up when the sun rises or before it does, you do your birding, and then the birds kind of disappear, and then you can switch to dragonflies, and then you can do that until the evening, till dusk, when then the dragonflies go away, and then maybe you can find some more birds. I recommend a net. You need an aerial net and maybe a good guidebook and some friends. Bring them with you. It is a uh, hilarious action sport to watch people run around and try and catch dragonflies because you swing and miss more often than you swing and catch. Um, but both of them are exciting and fun to both do and to watch. Um, the, I, I wish I knew, Chris, do you know? Yeah, here's a picture of me swinging and actually missing. <laughs> I swung a lot that day. I was in the Tar River here and I didn't catch anything, but I got some good nymphs. Um, Chris, do you know, is there, there, is there a North Carolina Dragonfly Society? Because if there's not, maybe we should think about starting one. Um, you know what? I don't know. I feel like there must be one because at the Museum of Natural Sciences, we have plenty of invertebrate experts and we have a, an aquatic entomologist on staff, our head of citizen science. Mm -hmm. You've met Chris Goforth. Uh, yes, is, she's is a dragonfly person. Mm -hmm. Chris so is incredible. To... Uh, the chat will have to let me know if they know that there's an NC Dragonfly Society or not. Mm -hmm. If there is, I want to be part of it. Okay, uh, let's see. Looking at the clock. Oh, there's so many great questions here. All right. Where? Oh, of course. Where can educators find the curricula that oh. you've designed? Thank you for asking that question. So I have a website. It's called Amy Dragonfly, A-M-I Dragonfly.com. And um, you can download all of the curricula I've written there for free. I wrote a bunch for the University of Minnesota about citizen science. So there's one about dragonflies. That one's about migratory dragonflies. And there's one about birds and pollinators. And um, then the dragonfly curriculum that I wrote is in English 
and in Spanish to download for free. And this year I'm working with, again, the U.S. Forest Service International Programs, Wings Across the America Migration Program to translate it into Portuguese. And then hopefully next year or the year after we'll put it into French. So then all of the major languages of the Western Hemisphere will be able to use it. But they're all free and you can download them from my website, amydragonfly.com. I'm just typing that in to make sure that's right. Yes, it is. Um, you can buy the Perfect. Dragonfly curriculum guide, uh, the paper version off Amazon. That one's not free. You have to pay for the paper version. If you want the free one, just go to my website. Excellent. And for everybody watching, I just dropped that link into the chat. So it's right there. Click away. Download away. Okay. Uh, let's see. Lynn writes, how does the diet of dragonfly larvae compare to the diet of the adult dragonfly in most species? Oh, I love this question. So dragonflies, both as nymphs and as adults, are jerks. They eat whatever they can eat, whatever they can get, anything that's <laughs> smaller than them. So big dragonfly larvae will eat tiny dragonfly larvae. A big dragonfly larva can eat a fish, like a tiny fish. Like So it's just all about size. And that's why that question about size and commonness was interesting because bigger things in ponds eat littler, littler things. Um, and as adults, they're the same way. They just eat, eat. So as an adult, all they're really interested in is, is mating and laying eggs, you know, reproducing, maybe migrating if they're a migrator, but there's only like a handful of species. So they just want to like eat, they get enough energy to mate and lay their eggs and then they die and then their offspring reproduce. But when they, they just are jerks, like some of them, there's one giant, beautiful, gorgeous dragonfly called the dragon hunter because it hunts other adult dragonflies. I've even seen photos. This is still kind of like controversial, but I've seen photos of the dragon hunter eating a hummingbird. So whether this photo was staged or not is a little bit contentious, but it doesn't seem completely impossible that this huge beast mm -hmm. of a dragonfly could could bring down and eat a hummingbird. Wow, that's like a battle of the best flyers in the animal kingdom, isn't it? Yeah, so I think it's so funny when people talk about dragonflies and they're like, oh, they're my spirit animal, or they're like really, they represent this the kind of like soft, beautiful, kind thing to them, which is cool because it's very different. But to me, they represent like ruthless hunters that will eat each other at all costs to reproduce. So <laughs> they're kind of like, um, I guess they're kind of what, <laughs> like a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Like they look all beautiful and delicate and sweet, but they're really mean and aggressive on the inside. There you, there you have it, folks. Mean, ruthless dragonflies. All right. Uh, let's see. The next question here, can you tell us a bit about reporting sightings on Odonata Central? Yes. So Odonata Central, they just, they just have an app now too, so you can use it on your phone or tablet. And you need to get a picture. It's very similar to iNaturalist. You get a picture of the dragonfly. For identifying dragonflies, it's awesome if you can get a picture from the side and then maybe from the top. Like those are kind of the two most important angles. Sometimes like the bits and the shapes of the reproductive parts at the tip of their abdomen are important too. But just upload a photo to Odinata Central and that you, you submit what you think it is. And then they have a bunch of experts that go through and vet. So they'll confirm your identification as being right. If it's a little off, they'll correct it. And if it's unknown, they might just mark that it's unknown. So it has this sort of, um, crowdsourcing the same way that our naturalist does, but it has a smaller group of vetters, like their small group of dragonfly experts, um, which actually doesn't include me because confession time, I am terrible at ID. My strength is in understanding and being curious about the ecological connections. I'm not the kind of person to look at any dragonfly in North America and tell you what it is, just like that. I need a guide or a helper. Um, I'm really good at understanding about how the abiotics like the air temperature and the soil and the wind and the weather interact with the living creatures so that's what partnerships are for right 
I have people that work with me that are good at the ID and I bring in my strengths with the ecological connections and together we make super science. There you go. Love it. Absolutely love it. Okay, uh, let's see here. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, this is a short one. Do dragonflies glow in the dark? <laughs> um, sadly, they don't, but I would love it if that was discovered by somebody. Maybe the person that wrote that question could do like a research and find one. Um, I did write a paper once for one of my undergraduate topics. Yeah, I, I wrote a paper once where um, I imagined that they glowed, but I have not yet seen one in real life that glows. <laughs> maybe if one eats a lightning bug, you could just maybe see some glowing bits as it's chewing, but I think that might be the only time that they glow. <laughs> I guess it's, that's, that is an interesting question because we've learned that there are so many insects that see UV light uh, or that maybe use fluorescence in some mm -hmm. way to, to communicate. Uh, mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting if dragonflies have any kind of similar thing going on. Well, they can see UV light. Their eyesight is stupendous. It's incredible. And they have the capacity to see both polarized and UV light. But maybe we should shine some black lights on them and see if they fluoresce. We could write a grant. Let's catch a bunch of dragonflies and put them under a black light. Boom. If anything, we've got a cool educational program we could do. Sounds fun to me. Okay, let's see here. Uh, just a few minutes left in the show. And Kurt has posted an interesting question. Care to talk more about common green darner, winter freeze out, spring repopulation, and this is interesting, fishless ponds? Yes. So common green darners are most abundant in fishless ponds because they are giant dopes. And they don't know, the nymphs don't know that they should swim away from fish. They kind of swim right up to them and they're like, hey, how you doing, dude? And then the fish eats them. So in ponds that have fish, common green darners don't survive to adulthood. Now, what's a really great way to get a pond to become fishless? And a great way to kill all the fish in a pond is to freeze it solid in winter. So we find these common green darners in these shallow ponds that experience periodic freeze outs and that killed all the fish and that allows the common green darners to live there. Now those years where they have a freeze out, a winter kill we call it, that also kills the common green darners. So they lose out for that one year. But come spring the migrators come and repopulate that pond with the baby common green darner eggs. And then the cycle begins again. And the fish can't repopulate that quickly or that easily. So it's kind of worth the trade-off for the common green darners to have one year in every few where they all die, to have a habitat that doesn't have fish where they can survive in those other years where there's more mild winters. Aha, uh -huh. there you go. I have a feeling Kurt knew the answer to that question already, but I'm glad that he posted it in the chat. <laughs> Since I think it's the same Kurt that took some of those pictures we were looking at I'm glad you're here, Kurt. I, I appreciate it. Okay, the last question that I see here in the chat, and it's right on time, why do dragonflies have different colors? Why do they have different colors? Well, that's a really amazing question, and I don't know if I can answer that with 100% certainty, but I can tell you that dragonflies, some of them communicate like birds in the way that the um, males and females will choose mates based on coloration and displays of either territory or strength and color can be related to that for sure. Before, can, can, I, can I give a quick shout out to an organization called NPOC before we run out of time? So this is um, an organization, remember I talked about being a woman in science and about how I wanted to hold the door open for other women too? Well, there's an organization for people of color called Entomologists for People of Color, and POC. And this, non, I think it's a nonprofit, but it's a group that gives, matches up students interested in entomology with free professional memberships in society, including the Dragonfly Society of the Americas. 
So you can just Google ent POC or entomologist people of color. And if you want to find a door that's being held open for you, you can find one there through that nonprofit. I w that was actually, I was gonna say, Dr. Thompson, you've been such a great role model here and been such a great guest on the show. For other folks who want to be interested in dragonflies and doing scientific research, what are some ways that they can find opportunities and mentorship and POC? I just dropped the link to it in the chat. Excellent stuff. I'll also drop the link to your website to this organization into the video description instead of just the chat. So after tonight's show ends, everybody, I'm going to put those links right into the video description. You'll be able to come back here to this link anytime. Rewatch the show because I hope you enjoyed it. And you'll also have quick access to that, uh, to that great information. Thank you so much. I think. Amy, thank you for being on the show tonight. This has been fabulous. I've learned. I thought I knew a few things about dragonflies. You know, I work at a natural history museum. I have a coworker who's a dragonfly expert. I've heard dragonfly talks, but learned more than I maybe initially expected to when we said we were going to do dragonflies tonight. So I'm very grateful to have you on the show. I'm so grateful to have been here. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you to everybody who attended. Thank you for coming. Thanks, everybody. Hey, uh, like I said, we'll be here next Thursday, 7 o'clock Eastern as well. We're going to switch gears, though. We're going to talk dinosaurs next Thursday night. We're going to be joined by the head of paleontology at the Museum of Natural Sciences, Dr. Lindsay Zano, who will be live from the field at the Menifee Formation in New Mexico. They are right this minute digging up dinosaurs, predatory dinosaurs, duck-billed dinosaurs in New Mexico. And we're going to get to chat with Dr. Zano about the research, about the dig as it's happening. That's live next Thursday, 7 o'clock, right here on Science Tonight. And don't forget, hey, we're going to be taking the summer break. So I hope that you'll stick with us through the rest of June. And then keep an eye on naturalsciences.org for more exciting live stream programs coming at you. Also, you can follow the museum on social media. We're at Natural Sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Oh, Dr. Thompson, before I let you go, if folks want to follow your work, they've got your website. Uh, is there any other way they can keep up with what's happening in your scientific life? Yes, I have an Instagram account. It's Photonata. Um, I can't, my brain's a little fried. I can't, you, you'll, you'll figure it out. If you go to my webpage, you can see the link from it there. Amy Dragonfly. Do we have Phot a picture of- Photonata? Yes, Photonata. I'm Googling On it so I can P-H-O-T-O-P-O-N-A-T-A. Okay, yep, there's a picture of me by the microscope. And um, it'd be so fun to get some more followers. I think my photos are fun. I'd like to share them with more people and maybe get some new people to follow too. There you go. Share it with your friends, family, and even the people you don't like. Once again, <laughs> Amy, thanks for being on the show. Everybody, thanks for tuning in to Science Tonight tonight. I hope I'll see you again real soon. Until then, take care, stay safe, keep your community safe, and good night, everybody.